you very much, and thank you very much to the Scientific Committee for selecting my abstract. So I'm a paediatric neurologist, and I'm going to share with you, hopefully, my journey actually from the bedside to the bench and then back again. So I'm going to be describing to you a rare epilepsy syndrome called migrating partial seizures of infancy. I'm going to describe to you how I've studied this in a national surveillance study and how I've started to look into the etiological background of this disorder. So this is a rare early onset epilepsy syndrome affecting babies in the first six months of life. And these babies present with unusual migrating focal motor seizures before your eyes and also with a very characteristic EEG pattern which I'll show you. They respond very poorly to medication and will go through lots of trials of medication with no relief. And they also have severe developmental delay with many of them not progressing beyond rolling or eye contact. It was first described in 1995 and so far approximately 100 cases have been reported. So I became interested in this condition when I was a clinical trainee in Liverpool and undertook a national surveillance study with the British Paediatric Neurology Surveillance Unit. This enabled me to gather data over a two-year period from the whole of the UK and Ireland. And I gathered 14 cases which met the clinical criteria for MPSI. This enabled me to calculate a rough prevalence which confirmed this is indeed a rare disorder. And I described the clinical, radiological and pathological features in my paper in Brain last year. I'll just share with you some of the um, more unusual findings that we found. That many babies can present with different patterns that can then evolve into this electroclinical syndrome. So this baby in particular presented with hips arrhythmia, which describes the, this chaotic EEG appearance seen in West syndrome, and then presented later on with a more typical presentation of MPSI. So this is not a disease, it's a reflection of some underlying etiology. Similarly, cerebral atrophy has been well reported in MPSI, but here you can see that there's also some hyperintensity of the deep white matter, as well as um, cerebral atrophy and severely delayed myelination. Here in one patient we described some basal ganglia changes, which is unusual, and no mitochondrial causes, for example, were found for this, and this has not been previously described. So the genetic basis of MPSI, given that no structural or other causes have been found for it, has been described in a small number of cases, so two or three patients with mutations in genes which cause other epilepsies in early infancy, and most of these are within small families. Most recently, a group in France um, about a year ago described mutations in a novel gene called KCNT1. So because I wanted to really look at the disease basis in my patients, I felt it was important, first of all, to exclude this as a causative factor in, in their presentation. So I screened KCNT1 in my cohort through a combination of Sanger sequencing and using also a next generation sequencing panel which I've developed at Great Ormond Street in collaboration with my genetics colleagues looking at 48 genes including KCNT1 and also using whole exome sequencing in a small number of patients. This enabled me to identify five patients, so a 50% hit rate in this gene, which is similar to those previously reported cohorts. The largest previously reported cohort is 10 patients. So I've identified three with a recurrent mutation and two with a novel mutation. All of these are predicted to be damaging on PolyFen2 and other prediction excuse me, programs, and all of them affect highly conserved amino acid residues. So casein 21 is a really important protein within the central nervous system. So casein 21 encodes a sodium-activated potassium channel, which is really important for the slow hyperpolarization which occurs after repetitive firing. So one can see that this would be a really good model for a, a, a channel that's important in an epilept epileptogenic cortex. It's highly expressed in brain and forms heterotetramers, as do many of the other channels. So the mutations that I've identified to, um, the majority of them occur in this large carboxy terminal. The other interesting aspect of this protein is that it has very wide protein-protein interactions, including with fragile X mental retardation protein. So confirming that mutations in these genes in these early onset epilepsies must have wider functions outside those of merely an ion channel because they have such wide-reaching impact on cognitive function, etc. I've also identified a novel mutation in the pore forming domain, which is the first mutation identified in this disorder, in this domain. So having identified the disease basis for approximately 50% of my original cohort, I realized there was still a great deal that we, that we didn't understand, so I wanted to look further into this. So because I know that families are a rich area in which to find novel genes, I looked within my cohort and the continuing patients that were referred to me and identified a consanguineous family here who are Pakistani, of Pakistani origin with two affected children. So this boy unfortunately died at 18 months of age with a, a phenotype of MPSI, and his brother recently presented with a similar phenotype. 
At the same time, um, some collaborators of ours identified a family. So we felt that this family were ripe for investigation. So in the first family, I performed homozygosity mapping to look for areas of the genome which are shared within the family because they're consanguineous, and then looked at the regions which were shared by the two affected brothers and not shared by their unaffected siblings and their parents. I then did this in conjunction with whole exome sequencing in, the affected, in one of the affected children. In the second family, we performed whole exome sequencing at the same time. And by combining these results, we were able to identify mutations in a novel gene called KCC2. So we were able to identify in the non-consanguineous family he um, compound heterozygous mutations in exons 9 and 13. And in the um, consanguineous family, we identified homozygous recessive mutations in exon 8 of the same gene. So KCC2 is a, encodes a potassium chloride co-transporter, which is of great interest really in epilepsy and many other conditions. And in fact, if one looks on PubMed, there are over 400 publications relating to this gene. The reason it's of such importance is that we know that in the mature brain, it has a major role as a chloride extruder. So in the neuron, chloride is extruded so that when GABA binds to the GABA receptor, there can be chloride influx because of the chloride gradient that's been set up. As a result of this, the cell becomes hyperpolarized, so GABA is allowed to be inhibitory. In the immature brain, or in pathological states widely reported such as post-hypoxia, neuropathic pain, and also in slices from adults with temporal lobe epilepsy, we know that KCC2 is downregulated, and NKCC1, another potassium chloride co-transporter, is upregulated. As a result, there's less chloride ext extrusion, there's higher intraneuronal chloride, so when GABA binds to the GABA-A receptor, there's chloride efflux resulting in depolarization and a more excitable cortex, and one can see how this would lead to epileptogenesis as well as other pathological states. So this is a really exciting finding, and it's the first evidence of <coughs> mutations in this gene causing disease. I now need to look further at these mutations and try to understand how they lead to the disease. So one approach that I've taken is to work with some colleagues and do some computational modeling. So this shows you um, two of the compound heterozygous mutations. You can see here that this mutation introduces a change at this residue, which means that transmembrane domain 8 is unable to interact correctly and cannot transport ions. And similarly, the other compound heterozygous mutation induces a change in transmembrane domain 6, meaning it can't interact with this domain and therefore can't transport correctly. But all of this is based on a lot of um, conjecture on what is known about the structure of KCC2, but actually what uh, uses lots of predicted data. So what I really want to know is what happens to this KCC2 transporter. So to do this, I'm currently performing an assay using thallium. So this is a fluorometric imaging plate reader, and this allows one to seed cells, HEC293 cells, into a, a multi-well plate and to transfect them with amounts of KCC2 wild type and also with the mutants. They're incubated in dye, and when the thallium is applied, the thallium associates with the dye, is transported by the transporter, associates with the dye and causes a change in fluorescence, which can be measured as a readout of KCC2 function. The other really exciting aspect of this assay is that it's really, vi really amenable to high throughput screening and has actually already been used in the wild type gene to identify novel compounds. Recently, other novel compounds have been identified which modulate KCC2 function. So in conclusion, I think I've confirmed that MPSI is genetically heterogeneous, and I've found the first evidence of mutations in this gene which has been, pu been purported for a long time to be important in epilepsy and other neurological conditions. I think it's important to state that many of you may think, well, this is a, a rare disorder. How is this relevant in a more wide way? We know that over a million people in London alone have rare disorders, and about 70% of these are children. We also know from conditions such as Parkinson's disease that insights from rare causes of, of, of commoner conditions can really give insights into biological mechanisms and pathways. And to move things forward for our patients, to move back to the bedside, it's only through understanding these pathways that we're going to identify novel therapies and also improve scientific knowledge. I'd like to finish by acknowledging my supervisors and the groups that I'm working with currently, and thank you very much for your attention. Many thanks, and we start with the questions. So, um, when you go sequencing genes, you find lots of mutations. Yeah. So, just convince me that the two presumably heterozygous amino um, acid changing mutations you found in KCN2 are 
causally related to the disease? Have you looked in other populations to see where they are? If they're heterozygous, um, presumably one of the parents has got them, but they haven't got the disease, presumably from what you said. Yeah. So are you sure that those are causal? So I'm not sure. That's the, what's the process I'm going through at the moment. The evidence that I've got so far is that they're predicted to damage the protein, that they're occurring highly conserved residues. I'm currently looking um, for evidence within my larger cohort and also in other early onset epilepsies because we know that there's, the genes can present in other ways. And I think that the only way I'm going to prove that they're pathogenic is through showing, um, I'm doing some other experiments such as biotinylation to show whether they're, the mutants lead to a redu reduction in cell surface expression. And to really actually, the key way will be to show their effect on the transporter. So to prove that they are affecting the function of the transporter um, and therefore leading to disease. Are they de novo or do the parents care? They're de novo. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I think you said right at the beginning that this was descri first described in 1995. Mm -hmm. Now, does that mean it's a new condition or has it been just not recognised? Um, I think it's probably not been recognised. So it's only really in the last, I think, 15 years or so that there's been the advent of video telemetry, for example. So these children have long periods of focal status epilepticus where these, this flip-flopping pattern can be identified. So that possibly may be one reason why. Many of them also die in the first year of life. So if, if, if they're in countries where there's not access to EG, etc., they may not have that diagnosis made. Okay, so does that mean that nothing, or, or can you tell me what is known about prognosis at the moment, long term? At the moment, it's very poor. So um, they seem to fall into two camps. So some of the children die in the first year of life, largely as a result of the sequelae of neurological disability. Some of them seem to burn out and um, then survive with severe disability into childhood with relatively infrequent seizures. And uh, there doesn't seem to be any differentiation on the basis of KC KCNT1 mutations, for example, at the moment. But we need bigger numbers to, to know. Okay, thank you. And last question by John Seville. It's a very nice piece of clinical science. Oh, hi. Yeah. Um, I'm big enough. You shouldn't be able to miss <laughs> me. Um, it, this is a simple question. The MRC would envisage a future where you could do this study on de-identified clinical and genetic data mm -hmm. uh, without seeking consent by mm -hmm. doing that in a safe haven. Just for interest's sake, were all these patients consented for the work that you did? So for the initial epidemiological survey for gathering the initial data, um, they weren't because it was anonymised. When I went on to do genetic investigation, I went back and consented them formally. So I had formal genetic consent both for performing the investigations and also for storing their data in a confidential database. So you couldn't have done this without using I couldn't have done the genetic investigations or...? Um, no, I think it would be difficult. I mean, to be honest, it's paediatric neurology is a small field, and I know all the consultants who've referred them, so I tended to, to get to hear patients that way as well. Yeah, that's an important aspect for research into rare disease, really. Yeah. Okay, time's up again, so I think we need to move on. Many thanks again. Thank you.